Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our webinar organized by the, the British Chamber of Commerce and Oxford and Julius Baer. Uh, my name is Salvatore Di Chiara and I'm the head of the account management team in, in Singapore. Our company is a co corporate service provider headquartered in, uh, in the UK and we basically help company that want to set up businesses in, uh, in Asia. We do have five offices in, in China, an office in Hong Kong, and our largest office and regional headquarter in, uh, in Singapore. Uh, today with me, there is my colleague, Fabio Stella. He is the head of sales in our Chinese office in Shanghai and the head deputy of research asia mr kelly chia from from julius bear uh, after the webinar after the end of the webinar you will have the chance to ask any question there is a q a section and you'll be able to write us your question during the webinar and we will attend all your question at the uh, at the end uh, i'll now like to give the words to Mr. Kelly Chia and uh, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk later about what opportunities companies can grasp in, in Singapore during this time of uncertainty. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, can everybody hear me loud and clear? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, I guess we are all in relatively uh, unprecedented times. Um, for us uh, here, for us in Julius Bear, we, um, we would just like to give you a really, really short market outlook on how we see the global situation. Uh, it's going to be a relatively short presentation, just about 20 minutes. So uh, we will not be able to cover everything but we'll be definitely open for questions um, later. So um, I just wanted to check if everybody will be, is able to see the uh, presentation this time at this point of time. It says Market Outlook April 2020. Uh, yes. Okay, great. So I'll just um, carry on and start. Let's see if I can do this. Oh, it doesn't seem to be moving. All right, it does. So um, I think the most important question in everybody's mind is, are we ready to go back to work? Um, how long is this COVID-19 going to last? Um, this has been talked about a lot, but I think this picture paints a thousand words and it's just another graphical representation. This is by the New York uh, Times. Um, and it does imply that, you know, with uh, very, very strong protective measures, which means that we are in suppression mode, not just in um, not just in mitigation mode. Suppression mode meaning that everybody stays home, locked down. Everybody wears a mask when you go out. Uh, only essential services are being worked. Uh, with those kind of protective measures, our healthcare system is actually being protected. In that way, you know, if you think about it, while COVID nineteen is obviously uh, having the key. Um, headlines of all the newspapers around the world, you will also imagine that the, um, there are many people who are suffering from stroke, heart attack, um, some form of uh, acute and chronic illnesses that's still plaguing the world. And, uh, you know, when our, when, if all the ICU units are being taken up by the, by the COVID-19 patients, where will all these acute patients go, right? Uh, they have suffered a stroke or a or a, um, or a heart attack. So that begs the question, right? Um, do we, will we actually be able to go back to work earlier than expected or on time as what people hope to be? I think that um, as long as there's some evidence that there is, it is possible, we have Korea, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, sort of like going back to life, Wuhan, especially going back to life as normal. But everybody is, I would say, relatively compliant, you know? Um, Maybe, maybe uh, it's just a system in the East that we that, that everybody is uh, very well aware of the risk out there. 
and also complying with um, po policies when that's being rolled out by the government for everybody's safety. But it begs the question on the developed market side, right? On the on the Western sphere, if uh, if if there is a if there is an easing of the lockups, lockdowns, uh, will everybody just you know? Um, will everything just be loosened and we could have another spike again? So uh, it really, really depends on all of us. If you look at the next, uh, there, there are obviously um, cases on, um, on easing the lockdowns. You can see here on slide three, this is a worldometer um, chart and it updates this on a daily basis. This is the US new cases. I think this is an important um, market to look at because uh, as the US goes, typically there goes the most of the sentiments of in the rest of the world. So in the US, you can tell that, you know, there seems to be already a peak that has happened. Um, the key message is whether is this just a first peak or this is going to be a second peak. So um, there are obviously cases of second and third peaks happening. In Singapore, for example, we are having a very, very large second peak uh, concentrated, with, uh, concentrated within certain communities. It's the same in Italy. You know, the good, there is good news here. And this is the case where many of the politicians are trying to push for, um, for the economy to go back online because there are too many people with, without jobs, too many people furloughed. And there are a lot of people uh, having economic difficulties at this point of time. So uh, the cases uh, do point to a good reason for politicians to go back on track. Um, however, that's those, those cases, uh, this is uh, on a global view, cumulative cases, as you see on slide five, on all of the new cases um, till 10th of April, obviously we are now at 15th of April, <coughs> um, excluding China. So we had a initial peak on the 4th of April. And then uh, the, the thing is, the question is, will we have a second peak, right? And like I put a hashtag there, it really depends on all of us if we are adhering to safe distancing rules. I don't really like to use social distancing because uh, I think we all still are very social um, sort of beings. Uh, we need to just adhere to safe distancing. I think that's a more, way more appropriate term while we connect with each other socially over other electronic means. So the fact is that <clears throat> the second peak can happen. This is the Spanish flu, uh, deaths per thousand people. <clears throat> if you notice that uh, it has small, it has small uh, peak in uh, initially in uh, June, and then there was a huge peak again, a second a major peak sometime in October to December. And that's when winter started again, right? Uh, when winter started again, that's when uh, the virus sort of like is supposedly able to survive a little bit longer. And then it tailed off and then there's a t third peak later. We have to prevent this October or this you know, October to January phenomenon of a new peak that may happen for the COVID-19 because we are already going in the Northern Hemisphere where lots of the viruses are happening, or uh, the new cases are being developed, is going into spring and summer. Hopefully that will suppress it a bit. But I think um, it all boils down to all of us, right? Whether we adhere to safe distancing and the new social norms or the new, uh, what I'll term the new abnormal, right? The new abnormal on how we are gonna live with each other. Just how bad is bad on slide seven, you will be able to tell that the Black Death sometime in the 13th century, 200 million people uh, died. And uh, this was basically spread by rats or the fleas on the rats. Um, interestingly, in the U in, uh, in UK, the Great Fire of London was the one that uh, helped obliterate this, this, uh, this situation because uh, it, it took out the, um, it, the, all the rats that were in the sewers were all burned to death, and in in that moment of um, in that moment, the the plague was generally stopped in the UK. How does it look like for us here today on slide eight? You will be able to see the um, we this this box red box image I've highlighted <coughs> is the death toll on fifteenth of March, exactly one month ago. It was six thousand four hundred people, and today is past 120,000 people in just 30 days. So this can be very, very accelerative. In fact, we are already probably going to be past the yellow fever uh, death uh, rate in, um, for, for the COVID-19 virus. 
So we really need to take this very, very seriously. And this is just an aspect of how you know, all of these uh, diseases or pandemic outbreaks has um, impacted all of us here. So with that in mind, uh, this is, uh, you see on slide <coughs> 9, this is uh, Julius Best's um, base case scenario. Where we see markets today is that we are definitely in a recession and we would term it a black swan because I think most of us didn't uh, foresee it coming this way. Um, and the probability of us staying in a recession for either a quarter or two, it all depends on number one, whether we can restart work and number two, um, the contingent of us restarting work obviously is, is, is um, premised upon whether we have a very, very, we can sustain or continue to lower the number of new cases for this virus. So we are in a recession at this point of time. The, the key thing about the, this recession is that um, many of the high skilled workers, as you can tell on the blue line seen here, the changes in job employment for the very, very high skilled workers has not changed much, meaning that the most of the very well skilled workers retain their jobs. Uh, unfortunately, the low skilled and the middle skilled workers hasn't really recovered, you know, from the global financial crisis days. And they, if you look at the light blue line and the pink line, the number of job losses um, has increased significantly, right? Uh, in the US, obviously, we saw the payroll, num the um, uh, initial claims, 6.6 .6 million people have filed for, um, for claims because they've basically lost their jobs. And I think that as long as the total number of these <coughs> jobs lost does not recover, meaning that, you know, uh, we don't have a recovery on the job situation, we will stay in recession longer, which comes back to the case of the economy, right? Um, this is just a graphical representation. Uh, I've taken this from a query, but nonetheless, you will see most or if not all of the, um, <coughs> uh, all of the, uh, economists putting out numbers or pictures like this. Number one, you see the very big dip in 2009. That's the global financial crisis. And on the right, you see two, uh, two different scenarios. Number one, <clears throat> on the red line, which is the typical forecast, you know, a relatively sharp uh, drop and then a quick recovery. Or we can get a very, very bad scenario in the black line where you have a very, very deep uh, recession because of the number of jobs that have been lost. Everybody basically uh, curtails their spending um, instead of uh, instead of um, you just spend less in general, and that has a very big tailwind effect uh, or headwind effect to the um, global economy. <clears throat> just on stock market, because you know over here at Julius Bear we are a bank, and in essence we try to we try to manage our clients' money as best as possible. Um, pardon the headlines. The headlines are not exactly accurate, um, but we this is uh, this is uh, just a representation of how bad this drawdown has been. Um, this has been the worst, obviously, since the global financial crisis, which the markets ended down about fifty-two percent uh, from peak to trough uh, for us from the middle of February to where we where we were at the bottom. We were actually down thirty-two percent. Uh, currently, we have recovered very, very significantly. In fact, from the bottom, uh, we are up almost 30%, right? So this is quite an incredible, um, incredibly volatile market in which we are seeing today. Um, there are many instances, you know, of uh, bear market rallies. And we think that at this point of time, this is very, very high chance that we have a bear market rally. You notice that these four particular um, situations starting on the top left, uh, in 1981 to 1982, this is the stagflation, high interest rates. The golden parts are the parts where you've had very violent rebounds. I think this is what we're seeing today. Um, we've also had it in the 1990s, you know, in the savings and loans and oil shock, when there was a very huge um, explosion of inflation and uh, due to the spike in oil price. Uh, we've also had this dot-com bubble, right, in 2000 all the way to 2003, where you had this very, very big rallies and also in the global financial crisis you can tell on the bottom right hand corner we, although we trended down there's always these very big rallies that you that can you can be see represented in gold um so we i, I think that at this point of time uh with how violent the the rally has been in the stock markets and for those of us 
who are invested in the stock market, um, this, this probably is a bear market rally. We are likely to see a retest of the bottom or at least um, um, some moderation or consolidation around these areas simply because the fundamentals don't, don't sort of like um, justify it. Uh, in in essence, you know, we um, in essence, you know, as long as jobs don't come back, I don't think this is very sustainable. <clears throat> Last year, um, well, uh, the good news is for those of us who bought right at the market peak, which is sometime in February of last year, um, this is just um, a average median. Av this is the sorry. This is the median, right? This is the med. Uh, sorry, this is the average number of days. Um, when a market peaks on the S&P 500 and it declines all the way to the bottom and the timing in which it takes to recover back to its previous market peak, all about 1,100 days, just slightly over three over years. So, um, you know, if, if you bought right at the market peak, fret not, you know, if you, if you have holding power, time is on your side, you'll be able to recover. But if you're in the right sector, I think it's, you will definitely recover your losses at a much, much faster rate and you won't need to wait 1,100 days. One of the reasons why is because um, contrary to the global financial crisis on slide 15, you will notice that the stimulus plans as a percentage of, of GDP rolled out by many, many of the countries and this is already outdated, is unprecedented from any other time going back to World War II. So the amount of stimulus that's being pushed out by every single country, uh, for those of us located here in Singapore, you'll notice that you know this is the biggest drawdown on national reserves that which we've had in our history. And I think that this is uh, this stimulus plan, both in the monetary side, which is you know all the central banks cutting interest rates, and also many of the uh, changes to um, the fiscal stimulus, meaning that pump priming economy dropping money into people's pockets. You know, it's the first time, ever, one of the few times um, in Singapore where we basically get money in our pockets, right, to tide us over the time. And I think because of the quick reaction of the stimulus plans, um, hopefully uh, we turn around much faster than expected. This is just uh, another graphical representation of, uh, we talked about the fiscal stimulation in the slide prior. This is the central bank policy rates you can tell almost every single one is cutting their rates and uh, with lower interest rates typically uh, there is more liquidity in the system and it does help risk assets like stocks uh, finally on a and on a more positive note uh, there is actually a lot of diagnostic and therapeutic therapeutic measures that's ongoing um, currently the pcr which is the polymerase chain reaction um, diagnostic kits are being rolled out to test for COVID-19. There's a serology that's a um, diagnostic kit that's also being rolled out now. And this basically takes a blood, a blood test, if I'm not wrong. I'm not, a, um, I'm not a medical expert, but from what I read, it takes a blood test. And it uh, basically is able to determine whether you have or you had the uh, COVID-19 virus and the amount of immunity in which you had. So, you know, as long as you, as long as everybody is able to test on a very, very high uh, accuracy basis, more people can go back to work because you are pretty assured that if you tested negative or you already had the immunity for the COVID-19, uh, the likelihood of you spreading the virus is quite low. So everybody will be able to go back to work then. But in that, in this slide, you know, this whole table is filled with many, many kinds of, um, uh, actions taken by the pharmaceutical and the medical in industry to be able to try to put an arrest to this very, very bad pandemic which we are facing now. So this is um, my final um, sort of like um, my final slide and it's just for us to really to uh, have a view on what to look out for going forward and for the next few months. Number one, I think we really continue to need to watch for subsequent spikes in new cases. Number two, uh, in terms of cheap and fast diagnostics, I already indicated uh, previously, you know, if we do get cheap and fast diagnostics, I think we can get people back to work faster because we are assured that they are not infected and, you know, uh, work can go back to normal. And thirdly, I think um, the most important, probably the longer term outlook is that what is the exit strategy of all of these lockdowns in the entire world? 
if I'm not wrong, uh, I saw a, I saw a, some stats just now that about 80 to 90 percent of the U.S. is already in lockdown. Um, the way in which we exit of these out of these lockdowns, whether is it gradual, slow, do we extend the lockdowns, or when we do ease the lockdowns, people go, you know, people be start being irresponsible again in this irresponsibility you know we get a new spike and then you know we get a renewed lockdown i think these exit strategies uh, by the governments are very important to see how the virus develops and with that you know we need to watch the economy the permanent changes obviously i think number one um, much of these job losses will not come back unfortunately um, if you think about it you know even though we hope that the job losses come back uh, if you think about it in your company if you're 100 people and you let go of 10 today or you let go of 15 people today because of COVID-19 and let's say, you know, um, in November this year, everything goes back to normal, right? Would you rehire back 15 people? The likelihood is no because you've operated on 15 people less. Maybe you hire back seven. So there is going to be permanent job losses at least for the next two years. And with that, consumer demand would possibly be permanently lost at least to a certain extent. <laughs> there are certain big structural trends in which we need to face. Um, uh, number one, I think we, here at Julius Bear, we think that there are some structural trends which are almost undeniably on an uptrend, right? E-commerce, e-payments, medical implants is something which we really like. You know, in terms of um, medical implants, you can defer buying a pen bag or you can defer buying a shoe but I don't think you can defer uh, getting a, an implant for your knee for too long a time. So I think those are, this, this is a, a sector which is quite interesting. Cloud, everybody's moving towards the cloud. Defense, obviously, is, um, this is this is almost a given. Every single year, I think uh, there is a continued increase, um, primarily due to the deglobalization trend in which we are experiencing. Cybersecurity. Digital leisure is also something that uh, is gaining a lot of uh, attention simply because work from home is probably going to have a greater um, sort of like a greater stay in most of the of the workforce at this point of time. Automation is important in factories because as you can tell, when people are infected, um, they can't work. But if you need less people and you have more machines, you need less people to operate them and, you know, work can continue. Data centers, because we're all staying at home and we are overloading internet. So data centers is something which we uh, continue like. Central banks, obviously, uh, will do everything that they can to prevent another Lehman crisis. So I think they have done very, very well in this aspect on how they are going, they have handled the economy. So with that, I'm going to uh, end here and going to hand it on to the next speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kelly, for all this very useful insight you you gave us. And I uh, will now move on to the uh, next presentation where we will guide you through our our slides and to see whether there are opportunities a company can grasp in Singapore during this time of uncertainty. Uh, as I as I said before, uh, I'm the head of account management team in Singapore and our company we help international companies to set up businesses in Asia and especially in, in Singapore. Uh, in this slide, you can have a look at our, at our website, Guide Me Singapore, where you will find uh, a lot of content regarding uh, tax, accounting, uh, immigration in Singapore. But you will also find some other non-business driven uh, uh, guides uh, for, with useful information about Singapore. So uh, let's move on with the agenda. Uh, I'll try to go very fast on the first uh, couple of points of the agenda to, to then focus more on the second part of the presentation. So we will see why companies should choose Singapore, not only to invest in the local economy, but mainly to use it as a hub for uh, investment in Southeast Asia and China. 
uh, we will des then see a very high level plan the company should follow uh, now in this period of uncertainty. And then we will focus on what the Singapore government is doing to actually help businesses and employees. And then we will finish with my colleague Fabio in Shanghai to see what China is currently doing and see what we can learn from their experience. So why Singapore? Uh, I believe most of you folks are already based in Singapore. So you're already very familiar with this. So Singapore is located right in the center of Southeast, Southeast Asia. It's a very strategic uh, location because uh, you, you can easily reach half of the world population within a few hours of flight. And Singapore is right in the middle of what is the ASEAN region. It is the, 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 the region in the world that is growing at the fastest pace. Uh, so why Singapore and why, what, what are the advantages? Of, uh, of setting up a company in, in Singapore. So uh, basically uh, the Singapore environment is, is really pro-business and pro-enterprises. It's very, very easy to attract foreign investment. And even more importantly, it's very easy to, to find skilled local and foreign talent. Uh, then the, there is a political and economic stability that in this period of uncertainty should not be always given for granted. And then there are a lot of tax incentives and investment incentives, starting with uh, no capital gain taxes, unlike most of other countries in the region. There is no dividend tax and no estate duties. And then when you set up a company in Singapore, you can always benefit from this ecosystem of double taxation agreements and treaties that Singapore has signed with more than 70 countries. Uh, as a result of this, Singapore has been ranked second by the World Bank in as ease of doing business. And uh, it's very easy to start a company. You can set it up in a few days and you can also have uh, a lot of protection for minority investors uh, and to enforce contracts. However, uh, not all the countries in the, in the area are like Singapore. And this is why Singapore can play a very important role as a hub for the investments uh, in other countries. So in this slide, we wanted to give you a couple of examples of, on how company can use Singapore to, to do the investment, to manage their investments uh, in, in Southeast Asia. So on, on the left part of the slide, you can see there's a UK company that set up a holding company in Singapore. And then this holding company in Singapore actually set up the, the vehicles in China or in Asia. In this, in this case, we can definitely add a buffer between the headquarter and the PRC investment. And we can also streamline the process of incorporation because uh, it's a bit easier for a Singapore company to set up a businesses in China or in Indonesia or in Thailand or in any other country in the ASEAN region. Uh, on the right part of the slide, we have another, another useful example where instead of setting up a joint venture directly in the country, so for example, instead of setting up the joint venture with a Chinese partner in China, we can set up the joint venture in Singapore and then set up the vehicle in China. Uh, the main advantages of this is that you can actually sign the joint venture agreement in a common law country where it is much, much easier to enforce contracts unlike other countries like China. Um, we, I mean, as Kelly said before, we are in a really unprecedented uh, situation and now company, they should 
start thinking about how they want to do the investments. And I know it's a very difficult time now. And I'm, I'm, I'm currently based in Italy where everything is, we are in total lockdown. But what, but we really, really believe the company should start already thinking about new investments in Asia, as Asia will be the first part of the world to recover from this crisis. So uh, we would suggest company to follow this very, very simple approach. So try to weather the storm now, but start planning in advance. Because I mean, uh, we, we said that it's very easy to set up the co a company in Singapore, but this is not the case to set, up a, to set up a company in China. So it takes at least three to four months to set up a company. So we need to start planning the investment now, especially in this period of uncertainty where, where we can also see other spikes in the future. So we will probably see some other lockdown after the end of this lockdown. So another important thing is that we need to keep our investment as, as agile as possible so that in case of a future lockdown, we can be able to shut down our operations without incurring too many costs. This means try to outsource probably as many non-core activity as, as possible. So um, let's now have a look for what actually the Singapore government is doing to, to support businesses and employee. Uh, we, we basically add three different budgets in the last two weeks. So the first budget was released on the 18th of February, 2020. And then we had a second budget released on the 26th of March. And finally, last week on the 6th of April, the solidarity budget was released. All of this budget contains measure to help companies and employees. And I would now like to focus a little bit more on the measures that we believe are the more relevant for international company that set up businesses in, uh, in Singapore. So the first measure that we will see is the job support scheme. And then we will move on the other measures to tax deferment. So our company can actually postpone their tax payments. And then our company can actually benefit from the property tax rebate that the Singapore government is granting to landlord in Singapore to reduce the, the rent cost of, the, of their offices and premises. So the first scheme and probably is the most important measures the Singapore government put in place, it's called, it's the job support scheme. And it's a scheme that will help the employees to retain their job. And at the same time, help, will help companies with their cash flow issues. Uh, the scheme was released uh, with the first budget in February and was then announced further in the second two budget. Um, the scheme basically introduced a 25% cash grant on the salary paid in October, in November and December 2019. So with a ret retrospective view. And then the, after the first budget, uh, this measure was announced and uh, it, it was included that also in February and March 2000, 2020, company will receive 25% uh, support. And in April, they will receive 75% uh, support. Then the support will go down again in May, June and July. Uh, as you can see in the slide on the right side, um, the, there will be three different tranches of payments that will be automatically accredited in the bank account, in the Singapore bank account. And to help company even more to 
the Singapore government decided to give out the payment for the April grant immediately, basically on the based on the October wages paid. So Singapore companies will receive a 75% cash grant based on the October salaries paid. And then of course this will be adjusted in the second tranches, as you can see in the slide. Uh, the second set of measures that I believe are very important are the tax deferment of payment for employee and companies. So for companies, the Singapore got IRAS granted uh, three months uh, deferment to pay the corporate income tax. So every company, they do not need to, uh, to, do, to file an application with IRAS but they can actually postpone the payments of, tax, of corporate income tax by three months. Uh, the same can be said for the employees. So also employees can actually postpone their tax payment that is supposed to be due now, because employees should do the tax declaration by the 15th of, uh, of April. But they need to do an application in the IRAS website. So also employees can receive this uh, tax deferment for their personal income tax. And another measure that is, has been introduced is the corporate income tax rebate. So th this has been announced this year and has been increased from 20% to 25%, meaning that after you, you compute your chargeable income of your company. So after deducting, deducting all of the expenses, uh, after applying uh, all the partial tax exemption or startup tax exemption, if your company can qualify for it. After you, you apply the 17% corporate tax rate, a further rebate of 25% kept at 15,000 Singapore dollar will be granted to every private limited company incorporated in Singapore. In the example here in the slide, you can see, let's assume we have a 500,000 chargeable income of Singapore dollar, applying the 17% rebate, the 70% corporate tax, income tax, sorry, we will have a tax payable of 85,000 Singapore dollar. We will then apply the tax rebate of 25%, in this case, 25% of 85,000 is higher than the cap of 15,000. So a 15,000 Singapore dollar rebate will be granted, reducing the tax burden to 70,000 Singapore dollar. And uh, the last measure that has been introduced is a property tax rebate. So qualifying non-residential properties will receive a property tax rebate for the period from the 1st of January 2020 to the 31st of December 2020. Uh, there are different uh, rates, so according to the different kind of uh, non-residential properties. But what is very, very important is that all the landlords are expected to fully pass this tax rebate on the tenants in order to reduce the tax, the, the cost of the rent for offices uh, and, and premises. Uh, this, this means, of course, we, you need to do the calculation, uh, but as a rule of thumb, we can say that this will reduce the cost of your rent by roughly half to one month of rent. So uh, I'll now like to, to give the word to, to my colleague Fabio in, uh, in China to see how businesses have managed their China operation during this period of uncertainty. But please, I know I've been, uh, I went quite quick. Feel free to ask me any question about the Singapore budget.
Thanks, Salvatore, for uh, kicking the ball in my field. And good morning, everyone, to guests attending this webinar. Uh, it's Fabio Sella here, broadcasting from uh, Shanghai, and I'm Oxford's uh, Head of Sales and Business Development for China, uh, as well as your final speaker during today's session. Um, I'll begin with a general take on what happened in the last three months and what's in the making by public authorities uh, in China at the moment. Um, in a nutshell, we're all men of numbers these days, uh, although not the ones that we are used to deal with as bankers and accountants. Um, as you all know, by now in China, the epidemics seem to be confined to Wuhan, Hubei, the province it belongs to, and neighboring ones. While of course we were hoping that there was no other location globally spiking to those levels, uh, China is now the first economy in recovery and a case study over the much trumpeted phase two, that is to say business resumption. Um, looking back at factors of, global, of local disruption, uh, the novelty of the virus, its concurrence with the Chinese New Year festival, driving millions of migrant workers back home, plus the severe measures uh, enacted in late January, early February by the central government to contain contagion, immediately impacted sectors and industries dealing with free time, gatherings, and leisure. The very same can be said about China's manufacturing mammoth that couldn't really restart its lines unless it brought back from their hometowns or quarantines something like 40% of its uh, total workforce as of February. A quick look at the right part of the screen where we summarize the general measures laid out by national and local authorities in China, uh, but no rush here as you'll meet them in details in the next one. Um, let me just focus for now on their limited scope and nature, given the fact that uh, China's driving forces themselves, that is to say the government authorities, are still evaluating the impact on the economy and future needs for wider benefits and countermeasures. Uh, to quote the WHO, uh, globally, we're just at the beginning of the curve, and the same applies to the measures published in these days uh, by the Chinese government. Now, as I promised, here's what companies have received in terms of uh, support in the, in the next few weeks and months. Uh, beginning with uh, point one, uh, we can see deferred deadlines for February and March tax declarations uh, set at the end of the, of the past month. And a week's delay too for the current ones due on April uh, 24th instead of the 17th. Uh, point two, a 50% refund of unemployment funds collected during the all uh, 2019. Of course, conditions apply over here, especially uh, the need for a lack of labor force reduction uh, by employers applying for that specific benefit. At point three, we can see additional reductions to social insurance contributions announced on February the 18th, calling for a total seize of pension, unemployment, and work and in injury insurance uh, for small and medium enterprises, which then turns into a 50% discount for large corporates uh, during the February to June period. Uh, point four then shows uh, amnesty or penalty uh, on penalties deriving from delayed local employees registration um, under the company's account uh, or work and residence permit applications and renewals uh, for experts. Um, the second last point, uh, we can see almost total coverage of online courses and trainings costs to employees during the uh, lockdown and um, outbreak period um, in order to ensure that companies were, were able to fill in the gaps of our time uh, spent uh, at home. Um, last, uh, just like for uh, the Singapore government, the Chinese one has, has tried to act on rental. Over here, we can see that discounts or holidays to leases are mostly implemented by state-owned landlords or assets. Um, some, of course, have been trying to apply these to private retail venues um, with little su success, though. Uh, what we saw is that um, let's see, we're mostly able to discount management fees or expenses during um, the period of disruption uh, and closures for uh, the main shopping malls. Now you can grasp here why I did mention how limited in scope and applicability most of these measures were 
as they were basically focus, uh, focusing on altering barriers and uh, issues for medical devices producer uh, while getting back at work, uh, offering a saving grace or a lifeboat to those sectors we indicated as primary victims of this black swan, as uh, Kelly mentioned. And finally, of course, re-establishing the supply chain of logistic and transportation, um, especially for goods movement, um, which had made air cargos uh, because of the several roadblocks uh, between uh, different provinces and the main, the main ports, um, and only few cargo trains, the only vector to bring supplies in and out of the quarantine provinces and, and China as a whole. Now, time to dig in the topics that are most relevant to your clientele, be it made of uh, uh, British traders or global businesses with subsidiaries and uh, operations in uh, China. Um, starting from factories in the mainland, your first and biggest doubt might be uh, if they were able to and how did they actually resume business. Um, now, let me just say that while we focus on the pictures that I uh, gather in this slide, uh, the luckiest and the boldest manufacturers, including the ones with output vital for hospitals and prevention gears, uh, were actually able to open doors as early as February the 3rd. Um, the first day back to work for whomever didn't observe the extended official leave uh, up to uh, February the 10th. So about taking laborers back to factories, um, and you can see here the data about uh, people and goods uh, that are starting to move back again after the uh, Chinese New Year break. Um, you have to imagine that uh, China uh, in the past two months was basically administered like Europe during the Middle Ages, meaning that each province or uh, kingdom, as we used to say, um, trusted no one coming from outside and implemented its own travel restrictions and quarantine terms. Um, in order to give you an, an idea, let's name a famous business to judge how the whole uh, sector was, was doing over here. Um, it's news of early March that Foxconn, iPhone's vital supplier, admitted that their plan was only working at 50% of the seasonal capacity. And thanks to government support on ending unnecessary restrictions and quarantines, uh, they are now back on track and full production as the end of last month. Um, a quick comment on the picture um, below, where you can see the uh, Shanghai con uh, Containerized Freight uh, in Index. Um, I push you to mostly focus on the fact that uh, the big uh, the big peak that you that you see in the in the fall of volumes are basically um, mentioning uh, not only the U.S. trade war impact on the on the goods flow over here. Uh, but also the fact that we we've always had uh, usual faults for Christmas and uh, Chinese New Year, uh, as clearly explained by the historical references to 2018 at the beginning uh, of the graphic. Now, with all the previous slides' uh, conclusions in mind, um, I I hope we can we can basically uh, focus on what expects us, uh, not only in China, but uh, in the global economy. So if we take uh, on a positive outlook, uh, this would tell us that the end of the SARS outbreak uh, was at the core of China's digital economy boom, which turned this country into today's uh, giant, accounting for 39% of global expansion in 2019. That's actually how for example, Jindong became JD.com, and that very platform feeds uh, Chinese households uh, in the past few months with groceries uh, every day and as we speak. Um, whereas it only focused on computers and spare parts in offline uh, retail venues back then. Um, on the other side, uh, the pessimists instead uh, might say that, hey, even though China can get factories back to work, and that's what, it, what it's been doing in the, in the past few weeks, how is it going to protect the markets uh, for its goods uh, now that the, the, the destination for those are actually hit by the global outbreak? Um, but we can't really use that argument if, uh, on the other side, any attempt by China to increase influence in other jurisdictions is the critics' favorite choice against topics like the involvement in 5G technologies, for example, or helps and aid coming from the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, we all know how sensitive is the donations topics over here, so we'll simply leave it to the press. Uh, 
as you can see in the last point, we actually like the realist view more. So after weeks of complaining at the wind or hoping for it to change, um, what if uh, China has basically championed discussion on how its internal demand was gonna substitute a growth model based on export, um, the effects of which were slowly starting to decrease, of course. Well, what better testing ground than surviving this outbreak and provide additional markets to foreign and important goods by other countries in order to judge how the local economy is gonna, is gonna hold this, uh, this, this black swan. So basically, as I've taken time on uh, what I believed is key for a future analysis in general terms, I will leave it to you to simply read a list of lessons, which then are very close to what Kelly has summarized in the first part of the webinar. Um, and it's also part of the, the set of uh, skills that businesses over here had to learn uh, on their skins during the outbreak in China. Um, of course, uh, this might be very localized, so I push all of you based in uh, Southeast Asia or from wherever you're, you're following us to rewrite and rethink uh, those same bullets as if, they, as if we were trying to compare them with outcomes for UK and Singapore businesses um, during and after the outbreak. Now, looking forward to answering your doubts and questions together with Kelly and Salvatore. Um, I do stay available uh, for more uh, first-hand recounts on China and leave the mic to the audience. Uh, thank you very much. So thanks Fabio for, for your presentation and thanks Thanks, Kelly, as again, to, to give us this very useful insights. And I would now leave the floor to the Q&A section. Uh, I can see there is already some question. Um, let me just read it. Uh, an attendee is asking me, could you talk about the Singapore government measures to encourage hiring for locals? What sort of support is available for Singapore incorporated companies? to continue to expand talent footprint? Um, as I, this is a very interesting question. So Singapore, Singapore is always looking to uh, encourage the hiring of locals, uh, of locals employee. Um, as I said, the, the main measure is the, is the job support scheme. And this measure is available only for locals uh, employee so foreign employees cannot uh, access the job support scheme uh, so this is the first measure and uh, another very important measure is the wage and credit scheme so this is a measure this is a measure that will help company co-fund the salary increment that an employee will receive in 2020 and as well as co-fund the salary increment the employee received in 2018 and 19. The government will basically give a cash grant of 20% of the monthly salary increment that has been granted to the employee, given that this increment is above 50 Singapore dollar per, per month. And uh, another very useful uh, uh, measures that has been introduced is the skills future scheme. Uh, under this scheme, all Singaporean aged above 25 will be granted with a 500 Singapore dollar cash top up on the skill development fund. So this will help employee to further build skills and capability. Um, I hope this answer your question and please feel free to write in our Q&A sections any other questions you may want to ask us.
Uh, okay, yeah, there's another question. I say, when you are part of a SME with headquarters in Europe, with affiliate in Singapore, not owned by 30% by Singapore, what are the measures to help us apart from the employee part? Uh, this is a very nice question. Honestly speaking, uh, most of the most of the incentives and measures introduced by the budget are accessible by Singapore company or at least company owned by a 30% with a 30% local shareholding. So the only measures that are actually accessible for company with foreign shareholders are the one I mentioned in the in my presentation. So the job support scheme the corporate income tax rebate, the wage credit scheme that I, meant, that, that I just mentioned, the property tax rebate to reduce the rental cost, and uh, as I said, the possibility to postpone the corporate income tax payment. Unfortunately, unfortunately there are no other measures that have been released by the budget for company with foreign shareholders. Um, let's see if there is any other questions. Okay. Um, if there are no other questions, I would like to thank thank again all the speakers and all the the attendees of this webinar. I really hope you find it useful. Uh, we will send you an email where you, with a feedback form. Please take take few minutes to fill it in. It's very important for us. And do not hesitate to contact us in case you have any further questions. Thank you again for, for your time.